In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost. Amen. So, as you can see from the notice board, once again, we're in that oh, strange time after um, Whitson, when all the Sundays in your Mass book have been used up. So, we keep the same Mass, uh, Dictit Dominus, um, as the sort of the common of the Mass, and then the readings are taken from the Sundays after Epiphany, which were left over because they were suppressed by Septuagesima. Um, so today is the fourth after Epiphany, next week will be the fifth, the sixth, and then we have uh, the last Sunday after Epiphany, uh, right at the end. And in today's Gospel, then, we have this image of a boat in a stormy sea. And I suppose whenever we think of a boat, then it is an image of the church, um, the bark of Peter. So the uh, church is in the midst of a tempestuous world, pagan world, an inimical world. Now, what can I tell you about our Lord's preaching to these people? Well, as the Messiah, and that's a Hebrew word, promised by God to his chosen people, then by and large, our Lord addresses himself in his preaching to the Jews. And the apostles, who followed his example, did likewise. They stayed in Jerusalem for quite a while after his uh, ascension into heaven. <coughs> but when the Jews were not receptive to the new and everlasting covenant, uh, the apostles turned their attentions to the pagans um, to see if they would have more success. Well, if they thought they were going to have an easy time of it, they were mistaken. Um, well, I mean, they hadn't had an easy time with the Jews, to be honest. The Jews had killed St. James. Um, they'd imprisoned St. Peter. But then, after uh, Peter had been delivered from Herod's prison, obviously then he was uh, put to death by the pagan Romans. Um, he later found himself in prison in Rome, actually, the Marmotine prison. And the same with St. Paul, actually. He was imprisoned um, at the instigation of the Jews, originally. But then he was, like his master, ultimately also put to death by the Romans, who were pagans. So what do the fathers have to say about these sort of things? Well, they talk about this storm uh, using both those groups, actually, they talk about the lightning of the Gentiles and the tempests of the Jews. That's St. Peter Chrysologus. Um, and of the persecutors, probably in relation to this parable. But it's, um, it's an image which is used throughout Christian writers. I found it in St. Thomas Aquinas. Um, St. John of Avila also talked about it. Uh, St. Alphonsus, right, right through to the, the 19th century. Uh, so it's quite a common uh, theme. Persecution by Jews, persecution by Gentiles. So why do we have this persecution? Well, I looked in another of the fathers, this is an earlier one, and this was at a time of persecution. This is active persecution. Um, and that is St. Cyprian. And he says, We have to confess that the force of the present storm of persecution, which has decimated the flock, and is even now still pouring out its fury upon it, is, to a large extent, our fault, because we have not followed the commands of God, which were given us for our salvation. Christ did the will of his Father, but we do not do his. 
living in luxury, as we do, and in pride and rivalries, despising simplicity and faith, renouncing in words only and not in deeds the world in which we live. We please ourselves and do harm to others. If I'd have said that, which I think is pretty fair enough, you'd probably up, up in arms, but it's St. Cyprian, he says that. Uh, and then uh, in the writings of the other ascetic authors, there's this constant reminder of the teachings of sacred scripture that actually tribulation is part of daily life. I was looking for something in scripture to support this and came across this gloomy passage from Ecclesiasticus. Great is the anxiety all men are doomed to. Heavy the yoke each son of Adam must bear from the day when he leaves his mother's womb to the day when he is buried in the earth that is mother of all. What solicitude is his? What fears catch at his heart? How quick his mind runs out to meet coming events. And the term of it all is death. What matter whether a man sits on a throne or grovels in dust and ashes, whether he goes clad in purple and wears a crown or has but coarse linen to wear, Anger he shall know, and jealousy, and concern, and bewilderment, and the fear of death, and the grudge that rankles, and rivalry. So, that's the lot of uh, man on earth. That's the lot of every man. Um, people sometimes think, I've got a hard life. I am amongst this number, dear faithful. I often complain about it. I confess to you, my brothers and sisters, and moan and carp and uh, kick against the pricks, as uh, St. Um, Paul says. It's a curious image of riding, apparently, which I didn't know. Um, but do I think, then, that I am unique in this suffering and misery I do not, because sacred scripture tells me so, actually. And everyone has it. I mean, if you talked amongst yourselves, which I'm sure you do, you might moan to one another. And one of you will have a go and say, oh, my husband, what a dreadful man. Oh, I'm just thinking of leaving him because he's a danger to my life. Why? Because he smokes. Does he smoke in the house? No, I make him go outside in the rain and smoke out there. But he's a danger with his smoking and to the kids. And, you, and you, you think, well, I can't let myself be outdone by that. So then you have a go and say, oh, yeah, but let me tell you that. And, off you, and people sort of think it's almost a surprise to hear someone else moaning and, and perhaps not a little unpleasant. But everyone has something to suffer. That's the lot of man upon this earth. Those are necessary sufferings. St. Cyprian says, because we don't live very good lives. We don't. We don't do what Christ tells us. But on top of that, the necessary uh, sufferings, I mean, these things are being broadcast, so people outside of Scotland will know what I mean when I say contingent. Then there are contingent sufferings. What does contingent mean? Well, it means literally not necessary. They are things that seem to be arbitrary or that could be avoided. So in the political world, um, we have, what is it? Is it malice? Is it ineptitude? Is it incompetence? Is it uh, ill will? Uh, whatever it is, it's there. And now they're sort of <laughs> down south, they're legislating about helping people shuffle off this mortal coil. Particularly when you get old, like me, 
you sort of think to yourself, oh, oh, life is too awful. And I just, I just like to die. I just want to die. Well, if you say that too loudly and the government hears you, they'll say, right, well, we've got just the thing for you. And they put you on the morphine driver and you're dead within two days. It's alarming. Well, it hasn't been passed yet, but it's going through Parliament. Uh, various people are encouraging us to um, write to our MP. Well, look, the law won't affect Scotland up here. It's just for England and Wales. I'm sure we've either got something like that or they're planning on something like that for Scotland too. Just to help people, whenever you get a little bit down, and people get down, then the government will help you out with this injection or that pill. Well, I don't know, perhaps they'll just save money and stifle you with a pillar. I mean, I don't know what they're going to come up with, but it is, it is ghastly. This is awful. This is dystopian. So we've got that, and we've got um, <laughs> the government also bringing in legislation, and I think we've already got it up here in Scotland about hate speech. So if you say mean things or tweet something, are we allowed to tweet things now? It's probably called kiss someone or X someone, I don't know. Anyway, whatever we do, if it's mean or someone's offended by it, then off to prison you shall go, E-I-E-I-E-I-O. And the rapists and the criminals who have been locked up for serious misdemeanors will be let out. And they are, they are left out. This week, there was a number of cases. People have been let out of prison early uh, so that there's lots of spaces for mean grannies and uh, spiteful pensioners who are writing things about the parlor state of the country caused by incompetence and buffoonery. Well, there you are. Or, then again, we have the storm in the church. I mean, <laughs> I've not been to the New Mass for years, dear faithful, but you probably have. And perhaps you still go. I don't know if it's a funeral or uh, a wedding. Uh, you'll be off to the Novus Ordo. And pff, I don't know. Is it the worship of God still? Um, it's very difficult to see it as the worship of God. It does seem very much like a get-together, a community get-together, and everyone faces one another, and God, if he's there at all, is not even behind me. He's being stuck off in some corner uh, or in a cupboard at the back. It's, it's, it's alarming. Or this sinner that's just finished in Rome, the synodal way. Uh, I mean, these things are just a bleak reminder of just how far we have departed from the constitution of the church founded by Christ. Uh, there are videos enough of these goings on on the YouTube, uh, probably the very worst examples, but even what passes as not so bad, you might go to a conservative parish, a conservative parish, where it's not so bad. Well, I mean, if, if St. John Ogilvy went to that parish, he's the Scottish martyr from the Reformation, he would be appalled if a Scottish crofter in the midst of persecution in the 17th century if he happened to wander into a church in Edinburgh, I mean, apart from this one, obviously, um, but if he managed to go into an oversword, he would not think it's a Catholic service. It, this is not mass, he would say. This is no why we're being persecuted. This is what they do in the kirk. Or I shouldn't pick on Edinburgh, let's have a look at Glasgow. If an Irish navvy in the 19th century should go along to the Novus Ordo in a church in Glasgow. He would not recognize it as the Catholic Church. He left his ancestral home because of the famine and is now living in a foreign country in Glasgow. And he wants to go to Mass, the universal Mass, which is the same throughout the world. And what does he find? The Novus Ordo. It's awful. This is a tremendous tempest which is raging in church, state, and also necessarily in our own personal lives because of our sins. So we're in a storm. And St. Cyprian says it is caused by a certain smugness, I suppose, complacency. 
among Catholics. And it seems now that Christ is sleeping in the boat. If Christ keeps watching you, then your faith also keeps watch, says St. Augustine. But Christ sleeps when the commandments are not kept or when, when religion is fitted in into your busy schedule. Look, you do come to Mass on a Sunday. You manage to find a time that's convenient, uh, but it's fitted in. Or you might fit in your morning prayers. Um, or you fit in your evening prayers. You'd like to fit in other things like spiritual reading and rosary. But there are so many more important things that you've got to do. Like watch the telly or play on your phone. So these things never get done. This, this is shocking. Well, there you are. That's what St. Augustine thinks about it. Um... He also talks about uh, when you bear grudges. This is the same as St. Cyprian, isn't it? It's not like this is a personal opinion. of they, they all say the same thing. Where you bear grudges, resent injuries, criticize and talk about your neighbor, can't or won't fast or abstain or indeed do any sort of penitential thing. And those are the people in the boat we're not talking about the vast morass of humanity outside these, world, these walls. This is the people in the boat. Hmm. Well, it's frightening in a storm. I was uh, once in a force nine gale in a boat. Force nine. And I was not a little anxious. And indeed, not a little sick. Uh, but... People are frightened now because of the storm. They're frightened because the Pope says this or, or the bishop says that or the government starts to make noises about the other. I mean, these things are, are bigger than us and we seem helpless against them. Well, we are helpless against them. There's nothing we can do. Uh, nothing I can do at any rate will say... Uh, will change what Francis does in Rome or what the bishops are doing throughout the world. I can't do anything to calm the storm. And neither can you. Only Christ can calm the storm. Christ, who is sleeping in our baptised soul. And if Christ sleeps in our boat through our laziness, then the storm arises. With a fierce wind, the waves menace us, and while they rise and fall in their fury, those who are in the boat think in terms of shipwreck, says St. Alphonsus. Well, how many Catholics don't think like that today? It all looks so utterly hopeless. You think, well, the world can go to rack and ruin, but at least there's the church. Or the church is going to rack and ruin. It looks hopeless. It looks like we're going to sink. Well, it's important to remember that we cannot look on trials and sufferings with pessimism. And similarly, it is not enough to analyse what I'm going to call their secondary causes. You might think, well, the first cause is the the government or the Pope or something. They are secondary causes. They're not the principal cause of why the storm arose. Who is master of the weather? God is the primary cause of these tribulations. And it's no good us, therefore, going into what, what is the reason behind why the government's doing this or what is the reason why the Pope says that. These are secondary causes. That's not going to help us. Uh, if we remember that God is the author of all trials and tribulations, that the very being, as well as the actions of all creatures, depend on him and remain in his hands, 
the whole time. Then we shall see that he is using them for his purposes. And if it's miserable and wretched, it's probably to chastise us. I mean, there are certain people online who love to talk about the coming chastisement, the great chastisement, and that's, that's fair enough. Perhaps we will get something big happening. But this is a chastisement anyway. This is already a chastisement. So um, he's using them as his instruments. He uses them to show his complete dominion over things created. The Lord giveth and the Lord taketh away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Tribulation which comes to us from the hands of a father who loves us and can always become a source of blessings for us. So this is a very basic Christian teaching, really. Uh, our imperfect and limited nature is a natural source of tribulations, which in the beginning, of course, was protected by a special gift from God. Um, that was the destiny of all men. But sin loosed the bonds of tribulation and it came down on us with full force. Because of original sin, all are guilty. Before baptism, we were all enemies of God, sons of a traitor, and God could afflict us justly. Well, you can say, yeah, that's very true. But that was then. I've been baptised. Why am I suffering all this? Well, there is that uh, event in the gospel, the blind man. Do you remember the blind man? Comes up in Passion Week. And the disciples ask our Lord, who sinned, him or his parents? Because he's blind. So that's a punishment for someone. Was it his own sins he's suffering that for? Is it for the sins of his parents? And our Lord says, neither. It's not because of that sin or this sin. The fact had been allowed so that the mercy and goodness of God might be demonstrated in him. That's what our Lord says. These things are in the hands of God. So, what does that mean we have to do? Does it mean that we'll become quietists or stoics? or probably in Scotland, I should say, Calvinists. The Calvinists do nothing because they think, well, there's predestination. It doesn't matter if I do good things. It doesn't matter if I do bad things. If I'm saved, I'm saved. And there's nothing I can do to change that. So, so do nothing or just do what you want. No, obviously, that's not what we're going to do. Christ is asleep in the boat. And for those of us who are awake in the storm, <laughs> in the first mass, Christ wasn't the only one who was sleeping by the time I got to this stage. They thought, oh, and not even discreetly. She put her head on her father's shoulder and tried desperately to fall into the arms of Morpheus. Uh, so Christ is sleeping. Anyway, I digress. Christ is sleeping. Um, we can we can wake him up. That's what the disciples did. Wake him up. That majesty which knows nothing of tiredness or rest does not sleep. All that he does is done for me. See how his eyes are shut so as not to observe and punish the sinner. And then see how they are opened again to encourage him who is trying hard to lift up the sinner who has fallen and then fix themselves on him who makes his petitions. St. Alphonsus. So as we um, approach the end of the liturgical year, and who knows, <laughs> perhaps, perhaps indeed, the very events which are prophesied in the last Sunday of the year. Uh, well, it's time to awaken our Lord. Not by shouting, Lord, save us, we perish, but by the things that St. Cyprian uh, St. Peter Chrysologus, uh, St. Alphonsus, St. Thomas, all these saints say we should do. 
How do we wake up Christ? By dogged observance of the commandments, by persevering in prayer, by taking up our cross every day and following the path that our Lord showed us. I mean, the bishops are not interested in this. They're not interested in your fasting. They're not interested in your uh, penitential practices, uh, your works of devotion. And perhaps, I don't know, I mean, I've not spoken to any of them, but perhaps even they snigger that simple people like yourselves still do these things, that you still believe that the Catholic Church teaches that, that Christ teaches that. They're, they're far above that, far, far. They are modern Catholics. Yeah, well, good luck with that. I mean, the devil certainly doesn't want us to do those things, and probably our neighbour doesn't either. Uh, our fallen human nature certainly shrinks from doing them. But those things are the things which will awaken God. They will awake the sleeping Christ. They awake the majesty of God, who is our only hope in this awful situation. We can't calm the storm but we don't need to fear shipwreck and the loss of our soul if we wake the sleeping Christ within us and know that with him we shall reach our heavenly home. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost. Amen.